Okay, thank you very much, Dominique. Uh, hello, everybody. Now, um, you will see that uh, I choose this photo to start. Uh, it's it's going to be a bit La Silla um, centered, this talk, but uh, well, yeah, I have to focus. Now, on the first slide, I mean, everybody of you has seen that, right? It is a uh, famous William Herschel, and this is sort of the birth of infant astronomy when, they when he discovered uh, that there is actually energy coming from the sun beyond the red. And the important thing about this uh, uh, sl uh, slide is that you can see uh, here's the signal, right? And, and he already had two thermometers to, uh, to, see, to, to measure the offset. And I mean, up to now, infrared is always, thermal infrared is always about measuring the offset more than about the signal, so to say. In that sense, very uh, up to date this uh, observing technique. Now, in something like T0 minus 113 years, and I will tell you later what T0 is, uh, another obs British observatory, uh, Charles Piazza Smith, picked up on the infrared uh, from Tenerife. He was uh, in Edinburgh then, and I, I have heard rumors that they still do infrared in Edinburgh. Uh, so anyway, he was able to now detect the moon, and he did this already electrically. And one should say it's very, uh, I mean, it's very remarkable because this was only, I mean, electricity was in its real absolute infancies then. And so you can see that uh, infrared astronomy was always also, also about being at the uh, cutting edge of technology. Now, in reality, for me personally, the uh, beginning of infrared astronomy was uh, the publication of the two micron sky uh, catalog in uh, 1969 by Neugebauer and Leighton. And just to give you a bit of the context, uh, this whole area was considered so wacky and so irrelevant that they were not allowed to use any telescope for that. They had to actually make a makeshift two meter telescope by themselves. Uh, the basically all, uh, astro all, all uh, professional astronomers considered the exercise totally useless. And um, for me, it's sort of the birth of uh, astronomy and who wants to have a a more US-based uh, idea about the infrared astronomy history, I recommend this uh, Caltech website to have a look. But they, yeah, share some of what I'm doing. Just to give you one example, uh, how revolutionary this um, uh, survey was, you have here one line, which I highlighted a bit, uh, the source uh, plus 10 to 16. Up to then, there was some smudge on some photographic plates, but this turned out to be the brightest 10 micron source on the sky outside of the solar system. And it just gave you an idea uh, what kind of novelty was in this uh, catalog, but uh, it didn't really help so much. Our traditional astronomers sort of ignored all of this. Now, uh, still things started to grow and um, on at ESO, at least in around 1975, we had the arrival of the first visitor instruments. This was sort of, sort of with a delay of five years to what happened in the United States. And uh, the first instruments were an infrared photometer from the Max Planck Institute in Bonn and a bolometer from the Captain Institute in Groningen. And this was actually a real challenge for ESO because they needed a real infrastructure, for example, liquid helium. And ESO actually installed a helium liquefier in, uh, in La Silla. I couldn't find out when it actually happened. It must have been around eight, the early 80s. And this was a truly heroic effort because uh, uh, Lo Enrique summarized situation in 74 by saying observing a 10 micron has been likened to observing visually through a telescope lined with luminescent panels and surrounded by flickering light as though the telescope were on fire. And everybody said, I mean, how, how, how can you do something useful under these conditions? Uh, the other thing I want to say is that one watt of, uh, of uh, waste power or of, of, uh, in, inside of the cryostat boils 30 liters of liquid helium per day. And then we're talking about 3,000 Deutschmarks in a currency of 1980. So it was uh, a, a real burden. It was really difficult. And for the observatory point of view, it might have been a pain in the neck. However, uh, already in 1976, this was the very first uh, infrared paper that came out uh, from uh, uh, the very first scientific paper that came out from the infrared uh, 
exercises on the SIA. And uh, if, uh, if you put it in context of today, the sensitivities people, uh, um, people reported is not so much a way, I mean, they, it's not so, it's not great because they had one chance key. 10 sigma in one hour, but um, Timmy 2 later achieved 30 Mchansky, but I mean, camera is different than aperture photometer. So it was quite good. And uh, as I will tell you later, uh, the sensitivity of this very primitive, very first instrument was about the same as the um, brightness limit of the IRS 12 channel. So in theory, this, in this instrument would have had an enormous uh, discovery potential um, but the, there was a community forming relatively rapidly, but it stayed uh, relatively uh, confined. So there was a first infrared workshop on astronomy that happened uh, in 1978. There were no proceedings, uh, but the uh, outcome was actually that there was an endorsement of an infrared program at ESO. And uh, ESO had, a, I would say, a, a real offensive to build photometers on the way. And the 3.6 meter telescope was about to be raped, as it was called by the uh, more traditional astronomers. And raping meant it was equipped with a chopping secondary mirror. Also, the first ESO infrared spectrograph was conceived. And uh, this basically launched 40 years of almost uninterrupted thermal infrared facility class instruments at ESO, which I want to really highlight. I mean, this uh, infrared had a long tradition at ESO, and it never stopped really. Here you can see what these instruments look like. Um, I mean, the, the classical Frank Lowe Dewar, I think like 15 or 20 of these uh, systems. And they were working on from the one meter, 2.2 meter and the 3.6 meter telescope. Um, this was actually the real rape, as it was called of the 3.6. So you can see on the left side, uh, the new infrared secondary on the right side, the optical scheme. And interesting actually, or the observatory hated this so much that the ring and everything associated with this was instrumentation. And eventually I ended up to being fully responsible of this device and of its upgrade and everything that the observatory said, we have nothing to do with that kind of stuff. It's, it's too wacky. And okay. Anyway, it all worked and actually, uh, yeah. This is now another example of why actually infrared astronomy was uh, always considered really strange because almost all instruments were uh, PI instruments and they were really uh, absolutely strange. So the difference was ESO had facility instruments, but this is, for example, my PhD thesis here uh, flying into the Gornegrad Observatory. And uh, yeah, I mean, if you did this kind of stuff, you were considered crazy and wacky, but I can swear you, this was the cheapest way of actually getting there. Um, this was actually my PhD instrument on Caleralt Observatory in 1982. And you can see me uh, doing daytime observing, which also gave us a strange look by our colleagues. And on the photo, I must say, you see about probably twice or three times as much electronics on uh, Caleralto than was a property of the observatory. And certainly also the small desktop computer computing power was probably outnumbering all uh, all flops that they could do with their computers on the mountain. So we were always considered, or and, and this is the same thing other people shared, doing the same kind of uh, experiments or observations. We were considered completely a wild bunch of crazy people, however, producing occasionally also quite interesting uh, papers. This is uh, one uh, paper that done with the spectrometer I designed for my PhD. You can see a fully resolved absorption line in the Martian atmosphere. Uh, in the middle of this line, there is an LTE effect, which was discovered by the uh, 10 years before by the Berkeley group. And over here, you can see an isotopic line. And again, you see I mean, the, uh, the line profile is resolved in something like 10 pixels. The really cool thing about this was that uh, there was no array detectors yet, and we could actually get from a single pixel, we could get 128 pixels in the spectrograph. I mean, this was quite uh, quite a nice thing, so to say, right? Um, 
nevertheless, I mean, at least this uh, we gave up because it was uh, totally brightness limited. In 1984, there was happening something like a revolution, uh, so to say. And this was really the publishing of the Old Sky catalog from IRIS. And then as soon as infrared astronomy could produce an Old Sky map, which looked as pretty as that one, the optical astronomers start to understand that, uh, or at least become doubtful, uh, that this might indeed be still useful somehow. And, um, but then it stopped also there. And there was a quote from a global speaker in Garching then saying, Iris has not detected this particular star, so we need to wait for ISO. So it was completely ignored that the ground-based uh, follow-up of ISO, of Iris could have been done with the photometer on the one meter telescope uh, being almost as sensitive as the Iris Ponces catalog. Uh, the other thing that uh, associated with IRIS was the discovery of the infrared excess of Vega. Uh, I mean, this came totally unexpected. People looked at Vega because it is the photometric standard and they thought this would be useful for IRIS and then they thought the, the IRIS doesn't work. But finally, it turned out that there was this infrared excess and, and this somehow um, broke the ice. At least this was the, the, the um, general opinion and all of a sudden infrared became a bit uh, more fashionable. And also in the other breakthrough in 1984 was that the very first uh, panoramic detectors came out. And this is, as far as I can tell, the first uh, published paper of, um, of, an, of an image of uh, NGC 7027, one of the brightest uh, planetary nebula on the sky. And uh, this camera had actually a 16 by 16 array. And, the three sigma level was at five Chansky. Uh, so this you have to digest to what we can do today. But anyway, this was uh, again, something like a, a landslide. And the other really important thing was in this year, I got my PhD, right? So at ESO coming back in 1982, there was a first real scientific workshop with proceedings and everything. And indeed, La Silla had now a lot of infrared firepower. There were the photometers and all telescopes, basically. We had the tropic secondaries on the two big telescopes then. And the first infrared spectrograph was almost ready. It was in commissioning. And we also had started a detector program at ESO. I shouldn't say we, because I was not at ESO then. Um, another thing that really helped to gain some acceptance for infrared astronomy was, of course, 1970, uh, the supernova uh, 1997A. And there, the ESO bolometers could at least find uh, the signs of the dust formation. And, and, and this was, uh, again, a paper that had a lot of impact and that convinced, for example, uh, John Danziger, who was a diehard optical astronomer, that infrared was useful. But it was you need a supernova to really convince people. Uh, here you can see our very first, uh, or ESA's very first infrared spectrograph. It was uh, commissioned in 1986. It had a homemade uh, 32 element linear array. This is the optical design. It looked like really a steam engine, but it worked surprisingly well. Uh, so here is uh, sort of the very first paper I wrote when I came back into astronomy again. It's bracket alpha and, and other lines in the uh, blue star. And I just want to say, uh, even though the instrument had only a 32 a pixel array, it took me a week on a dedicated workstation. You could not do this from your office or from computers then on your desktop. I had to go to a, to a workstation and I was working like one week to produce this figure using ESOS IHAP system. Probably nobody knows what that is, but anyway. Um, this is actually the observatory log that you traditionally got. You know, you had a strip chart recorder, which was recording uh, the signal coming from the uh, from the star. In that case, in the case of uh, ESPEC, it was fully integrated over the uh, overall pixels. But this was your, your observing log, right? And in some cases with the photometers, what actually you would take a ruler and measure the amplitude and, and, and get your photometry from that. Later on, ESPEC had a second lease of life. It became really upgraded to, with the modern detector and everything. Um, just talking a bit about detectors. Uh, so this is how it developed for the, say, for the blue part of the thermal infrared. This was the 64 by 64. 
Then there was a 256 square detector, but we skipped at ESO this part because the developments went so rapidly that we eventually had the, um, then eventually had the, the 1K by 1K detectors. And I must say uh, the, the detectors came really very rapidly, but we were sort of ADC limited because an ADC in those days was 5,000 Deutschmarks each. And if you would have a system with like 256 uh, ADCs as we have standard now, uh, it would have blown the, the budget of anybody, right? Building something. Um, another breakthrough that we had at ESO uh, was uh, in the optical where the EFOS. And um, I have to close the door a moment, please. Monty, be quiet. Uh, so now, um, ESO had this concept of uh, the focal reducers invented by Daniel Enar. And the idea was you, you collimated the beam coming to the telescope, you had an intermediate pupil, and then a camera, and you could actually change the magnification here, and you could put in various things in the collimated beam, like filters or prisms. And, and this was the most successful optical design done at ESO ever. And this has been copied like 25 or 30 times in the optical. And uh, the idea then was, of course, obviously, why don't we copy this in the infrared as well? And at ESO, we had then the infrared copies were Timmy, Timmy 2, the Sophie, which you can see on the right here, near infrared, and Konica, at least. Um, this is now what uh, the first infrared multimode instrument at ESO looked like. This is famous Timmy. Here you see everything. You see the, um, sorry, this is the uh, viewer window, which is also a field lens. Then we have inside here a germanium collimator. We have uh, various filters and we have various camera lenses. The camera lenses are in here. And uh, this is the assembly with the slit, for example. And here you can see the same instrument now working in spectroscopy mode. So we finally had a real multi-mode instrument. It was an infrared EFOSC. And since we were using germanium, this could be, uh, be done very, very compact. Um, this is what the instrument looked like. It was still liquid helium, um, but it was built as a facility class instrument. And the, this meant that it was not a PI instrument. Everybody could write a proposal for this instrument and it should be uh, operational for the users as transparent as our EFOS instrument. To a certain extent, this was a prototype of the VLT instrumentation. We uh, had the wavelength range from five to 17 microns, and we had also a time resolution of seven milliseconds and a spectral resolution of 150. Uh, this is what uh, the, the grizzles actually looked like. Uh, we couldn't buy them off the shelf. We, this was a project uh, I did together with the Fraunhofer people in Munich to make a transmission grading out of uh, silicon. Here you can see a spectrum. And uh, here you can also see the thing as a high-speed photometer. What you see here up on the upper left is the lunar surface moving. Uh, it's still a bit warm, right? So you see some features. And here where you have uh, the, the bar, you will eventually see uh, that uh, a star becomes visible. So we did lunar occultation on uh, the Myra star at St. Kankri, and we could actually derive uh, the surface of the star, uh, the, the diameter of the star can be 40 milli arc seconds. So this was uh, what was passed with Timmy. The real super event was, of course, Schumacher Levy. Here you see uh, one of the images we got uh, with the three seconds time resolution. Uh, unfortunately, the geometry of this event was very, very awkward. So uh, it was difficult to get any science out of that. Anyway, um, even though Timmy was very successful, uh, it was also very limited because our field of view was uh, about the size of the entrance slit of the ISO short wavelength spectrometer. So that gives you an idea <laughs> how small everything was still. We thought that 256 square detectors would become readily available. We wanted to get rid of the liquid helium, as I said before, and um, the closed cycle coolers basically give you uh, everything for free. Uh, we had some noise issues actually in the detector of Timmy. So we decided to have a Timmy 2, and this was designed, built, and delivered with a full operation software and pipeline based on MIDAS by a collaboration of the University of Vienna and the Vienna Observatory. And this was almost free of charge for ESO. This was a surprising thing. 
Um, here you see the optical path. It's again the EFOS type thing. We have a column. We have a, a this was the parameter, which never was properly well, which was properly commissioned, but then the instrument was decommissioned. This is the collimator. We have uh, again the filter wheel and the prism wheel, and we have uh, the the uh, various magnification the detector down there. This is what such a thing looks like from the inside. Uh, this is actually viewed from the back. This is the block with the detector and the uh, and the uh, lens wheel. Just to put it in the context, all the optics was around about 35 Kelvin. This thing was about 25 Kelvin, and the detector is 4 Kelvin. Uh, Five just, minutes. This, yeah, this is what the detector looks like then. This was what the prism looks like. Uh, I can skip that one. Timmy was actually quite successful because we had this rock solid PSF. So this was done stuff done by Ralph Siebenborg, raw image, deconvolved image of Cecinas. Um, actually, later on uh, with the VLT, we could verify that this was not speculation, but this was actually the true shape. Um, we had also long since spectroscopy again, but now you can, if you compare this Timmy 1, Timmy 2, uh, the same uh, planetary nebula, we have sort of improved a bit right in on, on all fronts. Uh, Timmy 2 is still available in the laboratory to prepare near. Uh, this is now the sort of coming to the end. You can build instruments and you can create a new uh, field of astronomy, but you also have to worry about uh, calibration. And this was the state of uh, infrared flux calibration. So there was this list um, done by uh, uh, Korniv and edited by Guy Yagnam, and it was just a plain disaster. I mean, some stars were so bright, like Alpha Ori, to burn out your detector, others were variable, but this was the status of photometric calibration in the Southern Hemisphere when I joined ESO. And you can at best say this is highly problematic, but uh, we have actually developed from that a real uh, set of calibration stars, and this was uh, also uh, possible because uh, uh, Martin Cohen, who unfortunately passed away this year, devoted a fair fraction of his life to give us the tools and to kick our ass that we should actually have a proper infrared calibration. But this was really not existing until Ralph actually started working on this around 1990. And uh, now I'm coming to the end, actually. Uh, the big question now is, can thermal infrared be quantitative or not? I mean, when people ask us, what is about the performance photometric, can you trust it? We always said, yeah, maybe 20%, but this was really never properly looked at. But this paper by Thomas Miller actually uh, solved everything. And uh, the, the one line summary of the paper is that a month of a receiver observing or a complex space mission can save you a few nights with Timmy 2 on the ESA 3.6 meter telescope. And this paper compares ground-based values published, uh, photometric values published before the encounter of the Japanese Iabusa spacecraft with the Earth-crossing asteroid Itokawa. Now, um, here you see the, and I call this really the coming of age of mid-infrared astronomy. This is the uh, shape model that um, Thomas Müller, together with Kasselainen, uh, could actually develop from uh, thousands of frames that have uh, an urban photometry done by amateur astronomers. So this is the very complex shape model. But the only thing they did not know is what is the scale of that? Is this a kilometer? Is this 200 meters or whatever? And the size you get from comparing the urban photometry to 10 and 20 micron photometry. And the outcome was 520 by 270 by 230 meters. And this was the paper was rejected first by the editors because they said uh, uh, Arecibo has found something totally different. And so the infrared stuff must be wrong. But actually, finally, the spacecraft arrived and it measured 535 by 290 by 209. And this is actually the, si the, the, the uh, shape seen by the spacecraft. And this is what came out here. So I consider this totally remarkable and that really made my day in the sense that I said we have solved it because for the to get at these numbers here uh, there were actually th two instruments three instruments compared uh, data from different observers but all using the same standard style list that we have developed and so it was possible uh, from from now on I can claim that we can really at the one percent level uh, do precise photometry 
Now, uh, of course, to summarize infrared astronomy, I had to leave out a few things. So I have not talked about Visir or Cryris because they are also not history yet. Then there were these instruments, NACO and ISAC, which uh, were also doing, of course, them in infrared, but uh, they have been covered to a certain extent. And there is, of course, interferometry. And we had MIDI and uh, on one side in history. Uh, on the other side, there was the uh, Charlie Towns or the Berkeley Group, the infrared space uh, Spatial Interferometer, the ICI, and there will be a talk about this topic by Jean-Paul Berger on Friday, and uh, who's interested in that, uh, please uh, look at this talk. I did not talk about high-resolution spectroscopy in the thermal IR, but there were many talks about this, so I think this was uh, covered. And also this general scientific impact. I mean, I can say I'm very impressed what you guys have made out of all the infrastructure that the observatories did. Uh, provide. And of course, I know that there is thermal infrared instrumentation elsewhere, like an Anglo-Australian telescope, Gemini's North and South, the Grunticon, the RTF, Keck, LDT, MNT, Polymer, Subaru, or UCURT. But I must say that uh, ESO, in a certain extent, was different because at ESO, all the infrared instrumentation was always a facility instrument with uh, operations, with pipeline, and you didn't have to go in bed with some PI that you didn't like to make your observations. So in that sense, yeah, uh, ESA was, is, I think is in a special role actually. Finally, I know that there's mid infrared polarimetry, but I had to skip it as well. And there, of course, talking about history, we cannot have beer together, but there would be many other things, including, so to say, blood, sweat and tears that were necessary to arrive where we are today. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Uli. That was really interesting. Um, we already have a couple of comments saying nice talk. Uh, we also have a question by Maria van den Anker. Uh, Uli, in your talk, you mainly covered the ESO efforts in the thermal infrared, but of course, in several other parts of the world, there were parallel efforts. Could you comment on how in different decades these compared to the ones in your talk? And probably within one minute. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, as, as, as I said, uh, the all the other cameras I know of were PI instruments, for example. And, uh, the, and they were based on the same detectors with a few exceptions. And it's, it's very difficult to compare things. Um, I mean, if I take the asteroids, for example, uh, there was a guy doing parallel observations from ESO and from Keck. And the Keck instrument had eight by eight arc seconds field of view. And they didn't even, uh, I mean, would have been better, right, than the 3.6 but they never found the asteroid. So I think we have been actually quite good uh, in providing facility instruments. And the, the, the other people did equally well, but since they were not facility instruments, it, the impact maybe was a bit different. Uh, I mean, they did very great stuff. I mean, to think, think about the talk of uh, Pedro Roche this morning with, with Granticam. But for example, RTF has certainly had facility instruments, right? So we're not quite alone in that that aspect. Yes, but I mean, if I, I if I compare the facility infrared spectrometer on IRTF, I, it is no match to cryers. I'm sorry, right? And uh, they they have not developed in that sense as we did. And I I mean I was asked in the context of cryers uh, uh, to give a I mean by some colleagues from the across the Atlantic to give a fair. Uh, idea what it took to get to arrive there where we are and I mean in the let's face it in the American system I think building something with 15 years lead time is is very difficult and and at least so you can do it and, and in that sense I think we were, we were doing better and I mean there's no point in I mean cryers for example comparing it to the uh, spectrometer that was on the Gemini South uh, it's um, we have created, uh, I mean, I know that these instruments uh, exist and we worked in parallel. And I mean, from the science talks we've seen today, there, there is a lot of extremely useful and sometimes probably even better science coming out of instruments. But as infrared astronomy, I think ESO is pretty much representative. And in some cases we were at the lead because we had uh, also a lot of engineering power behind our instruments. Mm -hmm. 